When I took over the company uh, in 2005, either you only die the month after. You know, learning from mistakes or admitting mistakes and kind of fixing it is something that the world is so bad at. You know, I looked in the mirror and said, okay, you created this, what do you do to fix it? And I didn't have a, a good toolbox of uh, what to play at. and frustration and anger could uh, kind of, uh, it's not the best uh, tool. In 2029, when Norena is 100 years old, what does it take to be the kind of world leading premium brand? Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, I chat with Jürgen Jürgensen, the fourth generation CEO of Norona. Today, Norona employs more than 400 people, is sold globally, and in 2022, generated sales of approximately 75 million euros. We chat about the pressures of leading and owning a family business, of putting the consumer at the heart of everything they do, and his obsession with building the best outdoor product possible, plus much more. Before we jump in, I have one favor to ask. Please hit the subscribe button. This helps us to continue to grow the channel, elevate the content, and to bring you more insights from other amazing leaders within the sports and the outdoor industry. Thanks for your support and enjoy the episode. Jürgen, how does it feel leading a business that's 94 years old, I believe this year, um, that was founded by your great grandfather that has so much, must have so much personal history and heritage. I mean, how does that, how does that make you feel every day coming to work? I mean, uh, my work and my life is sort of woven together. And um, I think I realized quite when I was quite young that uh, creating or building stuff is what uh, makes me uh, go to work in the morning. And um, owning a fourth generation family company, it gives you, I think I, I don't feel I have the right to sell it. So then it is to make it as strong as possible for the next generation. And uh, all the decisions uh, I take is in the mindset of, of that. So uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we have done and the decisions we have taken in uh, maybe in a short term span, they, uh, they seem uh, not the best ones, but in the long term span, it, it has shown out that they are very good. Um, so that's what uh, I think what I try every day to put on, not my personal hat, but uh, Norena's hat. Of course, those are woven very closely together. Leading a business that's been in your family for so long, do you do you feel added pressure linked to that? And um, and how do you deal with that if you do? Um, I haven't really felt uh, pressure on any time during uh, my work here on kind of the responsibility of the business. Uh, what's uh, the only thing that really stresses me is if there's bad quality or bad deliveries or kind of something that uh, can hurt our consumers. Um, but, uh, you know, all uh, decisions uh, that we take that maybe have been, uh, you know, not the standard ones is done in the best interest of the long term uh, view of the company. And since I was actually very young and since I started working in Norona, I always uh, seen the path. So I, I have no doubt of where we are going. So therefore kind of it is to go in that direction. Of course, there can be frustration of it takes too long time or the long term view has always been very clear for me and therefore no stress. Those factors that do stress you, it's it's clearly linked to the the worry or fear of disappointing your consumer. We are nothing without the trust of our consumers. And, and therefore that's, you know, it's about delivering the best quality. It's about if we screw up, delivering the best service to fix it. Uh, and as long as we can do that, uh, our major consumer group, I think they can always forgive us if we, uh, have, you know, if we screw up on quality, the service aspect of fixing it so the consumer you know, gets a new product that uh, has the right quality. Uh, I always find the consumer to be reasonable. If they're dealt with well, then yeah, I agree. Absolutely. But those, so those moments of stress, because I'm sure as in every business, you know, there are times where mistakes make. 
how do you deal with those moments of stress? Is there something that you know, okay, I'm stressed, I need to do A, B, and C, or is it something that just kind of you just get on with? When I uh, took over the company uh, in 2005, I, I started working here in 2000, but when I took over the company in 2005, uh, my father, he only died a month after. So, and then I uh, owned the whole company by myself. So there's there's no one really above me to kind of put pressure on. Then it's easy to kind of use the mistakes to learn. From. You know, learning from mistakes or admitting mistakes and kind of fixing it is something that the world is so bad at. And I try as much as I can to, you know, build an organization where we do admit that we do mistakes because everyone do mistakes and we learn from it. Uh, of course, that's uh, challenging because uh, no one else has no one above them. So it's easy if uh, you just say, okay, I did a mistake. But for sure, the biggest learnings I've had is from mistakes. Uh, and the biggest mistake uh, I done was when we, um, in 2007, we, we maybe launched the most innovative collection ever. We had put a lot of features that we hadn't tested enough on the sales samples. Um, and um, when we put them into testing, we had to uh, change it and find a better solution. At the same time, we had uh, kind of moved uh, from European production to Asian production too quickly. Um, and uh, the structure was not built to kind of uh, meet the things that we had done. So the project management of, uh, of the company was not good enough. And all the factories, you know, the, the product should have been done and they haven't even been started. I mean, uh, that uh, was the toughest time I had. Uh, and uh, later on, I had uh, um, hired a new supply chain director that could kind of fix it. And he called me uh, and said, okay, I know uh, I'm said yes to work for you, but I got an even better job. Uh, so then uh, I got that uh, phone call in Asia. That was like 15 seconds I needed to think, shit, is it worth kind of the work that's going in there? Um, and then you kind of just have to, okay, you yeah, know, it's going to be a tough time, but uh, you have to deal with it. And learning from those mistakes, um, you know, I looked in the mirror and said, okay, you created this, what you do to fix it. And um, it's the biggest learning. So it learned me something about respecting the timelines and never compromising on that. Never, never take shortcuts on quality. So um, it, it's kind of, it was the toughest time, but I wouldn't be without it because uh, you would have learned this sooner or later and it's better to learn it soon. Yeah, I can only agree with your comment that I think in the business world today, that ability to accept that mistakes happen and learn from it is, is I would say, all too rare. So how do you, as you said, for you, somehow it's maybe the perception is that it's easier because you don't have a boss, but for other people in, the, in your business, of course, do. So how do you try to instill that, um, that feeling, that approach in, in your leadership team, for example, in other leaders in the business? Of course, it is when mistakes come. Uh, it's uh, not to, um, you know, go hard on people because of the mistakes, but it is to, okay, what can we learn from it? Well, why, you know, what, to, how do we deal with it? And, and be honest about that. Um, I mean, when I do mistakes, I get pissed as hell. So I, and there's no one above me to kind of look down at me on that. So I understand the challenge, but I don't have the perfect recipe for this. I, I really want it, but uh, still uh, we have more to go here. And I think the hardest thing is this, okay, something did wrong. We did something wrong. We have to fix it, but we have to understand what we did or else we can never fix it. So smoothing, smoothing, uh, like, okay, we did a mistake, let's go further. I mean, then you don't fix it. So you have to dig down and figure it out. But this is never personal. It's about the case and it's about, okay, how do we as a team fix it and improve it? And I mean, we are 20 different nationalities here. People and, and cultures are different. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, to get everyone to believe, okay, it's okay to tell it and uh, we move forward, but learning from it, um, it's so important. Um, and we 
try really hard, but we still have a way to go. Yeah, well, I'm sure that'll always be the case somehow, I guess. Um, so looking back, I mean, you studied at business school, business administration and finance, but you've already actually stated today that your passion is really designing and building things. So I guess my question is, how did you find yourself in studying business and uh, finance? Because actually reflecting on it now as, as a learnings for a CEO of a business, it's somehow perfect, but it seems maybe not so aligned to your personal passion. So I guess, yeah, how did you find yourself in that situation? And, and were there things that you've been able to take away today and, and use in your uh, role today leading the business? Um, I think the, uh, my education is also important in running a business because, you know, if you want to do a, a successful business, it has to be financially strong. This tradesman mentality, I have that one too. I mean, building a great business is about, you know, buying at a good price and selling at a, a much higher price and, and being able to create this value, a uh, higher value on on top of it so um a lot of i think it's a lot of good um in the business education what i recommend to my kids i'm not sure if they're going to do it is to take many different educations like one year here one year there half year there um because also if you have the basic of the financial you can learn yourself the rest so i think it's if i were to do it again i would have taken pattern making graphical design, programming, uh, marketing, uh, you know, I added on a lot more uh, things so I could, so I knew all the tools. And then it was much quicker to learn all, all the rest, you know, I read so many business books, so uh, uh, so that, that's easy to learn. Yeah. And you mentioned that you, you have kids, so you're, you're the CEO of Nerona Sport, the chairman of Nerona Adventure, uh, a husband, a father of two daughters. What's your secret to find a good balance? And do you have kind of, let's say, non-negotiable things that uh, you don't give up on to that you know are important for you and, and having a balance? Since we make outdoor uh, products and since I'm the fit model of Nurana and I use every Monday kind of trying out the gear here, uh, but I also use time to test out all the um, gear, all the prototypes and so on. So. I probably spend 120 days out in nature, not full days, but uh, after work or uh, a year. And uh, a lot of that is, um, you know, of course, with friends, but also a lot alone with my dog. And uh, that kind of you get uh, exercise uh, and nature is a peaceful place to be. Yeah. And uh, I think if I didn't have that, um, it would be uh, I wouldn't find the balance. Yeah. But uh, of course, you always have a bad conscious uh, to family <laughs> or to work, to friends, uh, to everyone. So that's uh, just have to deal with it. You know, uh, I think in um, it, it is a hard to balance these things and, uh, and you have to take care of the family, you have to take care of work and you have to take care of yourself. And um, probably uh, you never get away with uh, I should have done more on this and more on that. And, uh, uh, I could have been more home. Uh, I still try to give uh, kids enough time and uh, good values. Um, I think the the balance I have it, it works for me at least to continue uh, working hard. Uh, you know, taking the responsibility and uh, being able able to you know take on whatever comes here. You know, running a business like this, it is you 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 don't get. Uh, it takes a big part of you. And so before you joined Nerona, you were a buyer in a, a local premium outdoor store when you were actually buying, uh, I guess, what I would, you would today consider to be competitor products. So looking back at that time, were there any learnings from that period that really helped you in those early days when, when you did, uh, let's say, officially join Nerona? Yes. Uh, first of all, I also worked uh, at Scandinavia's k Institute where when I, during stu studies and so on. I worked in retail um, besides my studies since I was 18. I worked a lot on that and that, you know, uh, Scandinavia was a really cool community for, because all the core outdoor people were hanging there. Also the consumers coming in were highly educated and the store was very specialized. So 
I got kind of my retail interest came from from this area. But when I worked as a buyer there, of course, I met uh, uh, you know, all the competitors to Norana. So that was really, uh, really good learnings. Um, I didn't finish the job in Skandinavisk. There was a lot more to do. Since I had a good view of the competitors market, I wanted to go into Norana and kind of get things going there. And so at those learnings, is there one learning that stands out that you were like, okay, this is the one thing that, as you said, that's going to really help you get those things going? Yeah, there, there are a few, but on the retail side, there's one because we build sort of a central warehouse and it's got novice because a, a few stores, but way too few to have a central warehouse. So when we build the first Nurana stores, um, we and we still have only one of each size in, in store and we auto replenish every day you know taking it from having this uh, big inventory to have no inventory and auto replenishment is a very good learning so a lot of the store development is kind of the opposite that we did in Skandinavisk sure. yeah so uh, just understanding if you want to kind of have a lean retail or organization. The logistic is so important. I was the first one to buy in uh, Arterix to Norway. Arterix was not a known brand in Norway, but uh, when they're, I think they did a very good job when they came with the first uh, Gore-Tex garments. And Nuriana had a premium position in Nor uh, Norway at that, at that time. And I put the first Gore-Tex jackets on wall. They were quite a bit more expensive than Nuriana ones. And I just saw they went out the door like that yeah yeah so uh, i knew we had to put on a different gear in the realm that must have been almost somehow disappointing shocking to see that the brand that you've been so or your family's been involved with so long and then this i don't know upstart coming from canada um is able to sell product at a higher price at that time what was it that made that difference do you think for them and uh, I, I think they made really nice products. Uh, I mean, they, they were super innovative uh, in 99 when they came with uh, sort of water resistant zippers and, and kind of taking that technology and simplifying uh, the Gore-Tex jackets. You know, we also had access to those zippers. I know in Lorena, but we didn't do it. And that, then for me, that was, you know, we were starting to be co too conservative and you know, my father, he'd had, he had stepped out of the company in 96 as a CEO and he was the chairman. And that was because of they feared some tax reasons that uh, kind of if you were an owner and a leader that you got taxed really hard. But when he kind of uh, quit as uh, the leader, you kind of lost um, the driving force of the company. So the, it financially did really well further on, but the, it, it kind of created a vacuum. And I mean, he worked so hard and I think he, it was really good that he did that. So he had 10 years of kind of enjoying life before he died. Uh, but uh, in 2000, I realized that I had to go in and try to fill that vacuum. You've mentioned there a couple of times that sadly, uh, I think a month after you took over as CEO, your father passed away and you've said before that um, you felt quite lonely at this time as, as the leader of a business. Looking back at that time, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like. How were you able to, to get through that period? What did you, yeah, what did you do to, to, uh, to manage that time? I was running the product development from 2000 to 2005. And um, after some time, I, I saw, you know, if Norana is going to be I know the world's greatest outdoor uh, brand, which uh, is my long-term uh, goal. You know, we have to change everything we do. And um, the old CEO and me, we kind of crashed on this because uh, he didn't believe that uh, Norena could kind of succeed internationally. We were way too small and he, he didn't think that was possible. And at a certain point that kind of crashed and uh, I told my father that I have to run the whole company now because uh, uh, I get so much, I get so frustrated in, in this situation. And uh, eventually he took that talk with, um, with his friend and the CEO at that time. And that was announced in May uh, 2004 that we're going to change 1st of January. And uh, my father got sick during the summer um, and then it didn't really, 
uh, we didn't th- thought it was so serious. And then a little later on, they said, oh, it's cancer. Uh, but still, this is a good chance we fix. And then in October, they said, sorry, there's nothing we can do. And then kind of his condition became uh, quite a bit uh, tougher. And uh, at the end, uh, he was hurting so much. So, yeah, you know, it was better to die than uh, uh, kind of lying there suffering. Uh, but of course, that was a super tough period. You know, I was preparing to take over and... Uh, um, I think uh, also uh, the old CEO and I were we were so different. So I asked for his job description, and there's nothing in that that I did. So uh, it was very different. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a tough and emotional period. And uh, Nuriana's chairman today, he came in in December 2004, and he also uh, been running a family business, and he's been through tough times and he's uh, very he's he's kind of very clear so he's been a very supportive and good help and a mentor for the whole way actually so you see that relationship really as almost like a like you said as a mentorship rather than like let's say the traditional sense of a chairman and being a boss so, so that mentors then for you you definitely see the value in having that sort of support i have so many roles there because i hire him to uh, kind of kick my ass <laughs> and uh, he's the right person for that but in the start i was you know i was only 31 when i took over the company uh, so i was quite young and um, of course you had some learning experience from being a leader but uh, i mean it was definitely more wrong than right uh, in my start of my leader career. Uh, of course, because I was younger and it was really hard to lead people that has been there for a long time and uh, kind of, yeah, they looked at you as, uh, you know, just a son of the owner and uh, maybe didn't have that respect. So it was hard to uh, move things in the right direction. Um, and I didn't have a, a good toolbox of uh, what to play at. and frustration and anger could uh, kind of uh, it's not the best uh, tool probably yeah. there so uh, so i think he came in with um with being a very good mentor looking back at that time you, you're very open about the fact that you know at that stage probably you weren't the best manager the best leader is there one period or one experience over the years that have um, helped you maybe develop more as a leader than anything else, anything that stands out? The first period, like uh, I, I put the development of Nuria and I into phases um, and kind of when I took over in the first five years, um, there was so much stuff to do. So the kind of leadership was, you know, you didn't focus so much on it. It was kind of getting the job done and we uh, kind of what missed at that time is kind of the focus on you know what does good uh, leadership mean um and i think we came all the way until 2013 and we kind of let's let's do a great place to work and get sort of a a benchmark for uh, how the people in the company look at uh, leadership. Um, And of course, that is, uh, you know, the ones that scores high there are really good and focusing on it. And the first time we did a great place to work, uh, I mean, I hoped and I I think I expected a higher score. So I was kind of, okay, yeah, this is something we need to focus on now. I think taking a let's say a more scientific data-driven approach makes a lot of sense you know you're taking that kind of emotional aspect out of it what i try to learn in these companies that the average of the industry uh, you know i don't care yeah. we're, we're going to be the best yeah. so we cannot talk about if we may benchmark against the average yeah. you know we're just fooling ourselves you've talked in the past about the fact that of course as a business profit is important for you but it's not let's say the the only driving force in operating the business and for you and you mentioned actually already today in the conversation that it's about uh building a a sustainable and uh, long-term business and brand for future generations actually can you share any practical examples of decisions that you're taking that let's say support and and reinforce that message i think we um 
we take those decisions quite often um, on quality, for example. That's, uh, I think, the best thing after this learning in 2007. I have good statistics for the Nurena quality way back to the 90s. And it's kind of been stable. And during this 2007 screw up, it uh, it's changed. It, 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 in the percentage, it did not drastically change, but it was definitively uncomfortable. But still, uh, just a side note, I don't, I don't know if you saw the guy in the pink one piece yesterday. Yes, I did. That was one of the products that we actually pulled back from the market in 2007 because of bad quality. Interesting. But it's still being used today. So, <laughs> so uh, our ben- but but um, going to your customers and consumers and saying oh, you have to ship it back. This was not uh, to our standards. It's so painful um, in the stomach, and uh, I don't want to put uh, either my employees or the brand in that position again. So we have had you know taking big cuts on um, on sales to say. No, we don't. Uh, we have the orders. Everything wants to buy it, but we are uncertain if this will stand uh, our standards. Um, that is typical decisions um, uh, where kind of profit, uh, short-term profit, is uh, is waived. I think also a lot of when I think about risk, uh, it seems like uh, often others think differently. I I think if we if you only have uh, Norway as a market, that's too much risk. So we have to go uh, on export. And then at least the home market, they said, oh, why do you want to take this risk on going and export? And I was like, uh, the risk is staying here. And that is, you of course, you sacrifice uh, short-term um, profit uh, and of course you have to invest. Um, I think there's many decisions like this. We can talk about travel where people also say, do you want to kind of spread uh, your focus. I'm saying, uh, well, I'm not going to spread the focus. It's under the same umbrella and it's not the same people that's going to do both of it. I think that is also about taking uh, short term profit and putting it into the long term decisions. The, that strong focus on quality, it's more, much more of a focus on quality versus quantity. And you said that your aspiration is to be the, the best or the greatest outdoor brand globally. So what what does that look like for you? How do you know, for example, let's say when you've achieved that, what will it be like, okay, we're there? I think uh, if you ask the core users in those markets that we kind of work in, that they say they have, uh, you know, uh, Nurana is their preferred choice. Okay. Um, so um, it's for sure not the biggest, but it, we need sort of a I will say still a decent footprint in the markets that we work in. And it's the consumers that decides if uh, kind of many and I think the the really enthusiast and core consumers, um, if they say Hurana is my uh, first choice, um, that's a good example on it. And do you see anything happening in the market overall that gives you cause for either concern or optimism? Um, in your kind of efforts to reach that goal? This is for sure a marathon. In, uh, in our home market, you know, I think uh, 80, 90 percent of the population know our brand and uh, the preference is very high. So even if we are, uh, uh, it's, it's I think rare to be in that position that you are uh, maybe the dominating brand, but also the premium. And, and it's a very kind of uh, edge to kind of follow because all the core guys, they want something that um, is not for everyone. And in the home market, we've been able to, to do both of it. And uh, so that, that is kind of a fine balance. But now we're going out and, and trying at least to, to uh, use the same recipe uh, going into our export markets. And it is about getting consumers to try the products and it you know takes some time before they realize oh it it will you you have to be in a kind of have it to use them for some year or be in a situation where kind of you see the, uh, the you know the difference so we i can do um, an example from sweden um it's quite uh, fun which i use sometimes because you know for norwegians to succeed with uh a brand in Sweden is, is not that easy. 
And uh, we had an example from a Swedish photographer. He won uh, the Gore-Tex Trollwagen jacket in a competition in the in a magazine in Sweden. And he, he was um, very happy with one of our um, competitors. That was his favorite brand. So he took the Nurana jacket and he put it all the way into his closet. And it was hanging there for a year. And he was going out to uh, 14 days camping in the wilderness. And he said, ah, I think I'll bring a backup jacket. Oh yeah, I have this Nurana jacket here. So on, uh, he said on day one, it started raining so hard and he was totally soaked. Uh, and oh yeah, I have this uh, uh, extra jacket. So he put that on and it kept him dry for the whole trip. So it was at least dry on top. And he wrote a long letter to us and said, no, he was a big Lorena fan. And so, you know, you have to give them the first product for free and wait for one year and have to put them into a, a tough situation. And then they understand the difference. So I think that that is actually a, a picture. So, but we are slowly getting more and more products out on people. And then uh, if they have a problem, uh, we, we will help you. We will, you know, we, we will fix any problem for, uh, for the consumer. It's easier in your home market than across. So, so we develop our systems and tune them. You know, we have net promoter score coming in like 2000 per month and uh, using all that feedback to optimize. Um, I, I feel we have a good direction with our collection and how we work with things. So it's very systematic and methodically put in place. Um, so I'm I, I think uh, we will have a good growth going forward. We also work with the right retail stores. You know, the distribution is really good. So so we are very scalable. I think we are at a good place and we're starting to get the awareness out there. Um, um, so, but it's, you know, at the moment, uh, the market is tough. So you don't, you know, uh, we still grow, but, uh, you know, what ha what have happened in the normal market? Um, so I'm, I'm a strong believer that uh, we are on a good way to uh, to where we want to be, but I still, I think myself, I've done a not good enough job in growing the brand lately. I'm sure without a doubt, your family has clearly influenced you professionally. And I'm, I, I'm sure also the, your mentor that you talked about earlier on, your chairman. But is there anybody else that any other leaders either in the industry or even outside of the industry that are somehow an influence for you? Yeah, I mean, for sure, Steve Jobs. I mean, he, he commercialized extreme user-driven product development. Um, my father and Thomas Karstrom started it in 72. And I think he, he just kind of went away from this, finding the average with focus groups and taking it to the extreme. So even if we had it going, I, I kind of I read the, all the books and everything about him. So I think he, he was, uh, I mean, uh, a really special per person. And I think if you... You know, he also did a lot of mistakes in start and 10 years off and learned so much and came back and and really did the magic with Apple. One person can uh, influence that much, I think is, is really impressive. And uh, why I uh, kind of like Steve Jobs is also because he's creating real products. Another one is um, Elon Musk. Of course, there is a lot of things and um, I just read the latest book uh, and it's he's such a fascinating person, but he's so far away from kind of what you talk about with leadership today. It's kind of on the other side of the room. I think it's a little interesting into the de uh, debate and I, I, I don't think that he's a role model for, for what I want to do, but I, he's, I admire what he has created and the way he does it. And it's so not textbook. Probably um, the textbook uh, management can also look a little in that direction if you want to have things done. Yeah. Um, I think as anything, it's getting, it's finding the right balance, but that almost, I see both of them almost as mavericks somehow, you know, that they, as you said, really pushed the, the absolute limits, um, had their weaknesses for sure. But so yeah, as always, there's probably a balance in there somewhere. Yvon Chouinard has kind of taken the environmental uh, stand. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, 
I, I mean, I, I think Yvonne Chouinard has been kind of more outdoors, but he's, he's more like his philosophy put into into Patagonia. Um, I mean, I think he's, uh, you know, he's a solid guy. What would you define as your most important task as a business leader here at Narona? Uh, first of all, it's uh, vision and direction, kind of giving uh, the direction. But there's also one thing which, um, I mean, we talk a lot about. And, um, you know, I have had all the leader jobs in the company. Um, and I, I, I know, you know, almost all details of Norum. And uh, I know that is not normal. Um, and I, I mean, I, I'm interested in everything we do. So uh, if uh, building an ERP system, a marketing campaign, logistics, production, product development, retail, I think it's all fun. Um, and uh, to kind of what you can do if you know your company that well, you know, you get you can build a holistic uh, thing. So very often you take decisions there. That's based on some advantages there, but they are not the best for the whole company. So the ability to kind of secure that all the decisions we take uh, have a holistic view and in the best interest on Lorena, that's kind of where I sit and, and uh, kind of control this. Yeah. Mm. So that maybe links to my next question nicely. So what what annoys you as a leader? What is is there one thing that like it just drives you crazy? <laughs> uh, uh, one thing that we work a lot with my my leader team is, um, you know, how um, of course since I know and and are so involved in everything, it's it's still uh, I want them to step up and and myself to kind of. Uh, be maybe sometimes more like a traditional leader um, and finding this balance uh, of if I step back, uh, you know, what do I say and do to to get my leaders uh, to uh, kind of fill that hole? Um, and I think I, the last few years I had a lot of learnings about how to do that better, not kind of wanting to, you know, this is a place where we had to work hard to succeed. So. Uh, if you don't want to be part of that, that kind of annoys me. And I think I don't have a lot of annoyance here. I think the people here, they, they're they really, really great. And uh, they uh, work really hard and they are very competent. So I'm very proud of the people here. So I think that I'm not, I don't have that um, um, annoyance, except that, you know, I, I want to uh, um, actually, increase Norona in the international scene even more. I'm, I'm a bit impatient on that. Uh, you know, all the things we would like to do, both on sustainability and building more stores and, you know, even more on the marketing and uh, adventure, It uh, it's all financed by uh, what we create in Norona. So, you know, the, the bigger I get, the more kind of profitable, uh, the more I invest in uh, in the company so it's kind of an ecosystem that is all aligned and I, I don't want uh, external investors so you know all that we use we have to create uh, so it's sort of a it's a big flywheel yeah. and um, um, yeah I am eager to to get going yeah. <laughs> even more a key part of being able to do that and you've talked about this in the past where you know when you're looking to bring new people into the business that you need to find that what's really important for you rather is that they fit uh, firstly with the brand but also with the people around you know you and obviously your other team so how when you're looking for people how do you identify that what's what's your approach in in trying to find those people the first part i can say here is that we i think every year we work on the learnings from recruitment and we, first of all, we come to a level that we we don't pick the the best position uh, that applies if they don't get to the right level. So we have a lot of recruitments where we say, no, we have to continue. And this we have aligned with, uh, with the leaders in the company that, 
you know we rather have uh, like a short staffed period yeah. than don't uh, finding the right person and more and more and more we realized the, the some parameters that has to be in there um, and I think we have uh, actually managed to create a really good culture and um, maybe the one thing that um, that uh, doesn't work here is uh, if you're sort of a, a superstar and uh, a kind of above uh, everyone else it's a very good team spirit and um, the other one is kind of trying to figure out if the people are willing to learn from their mistakes and admit them yeah. that's uh, super important if you I uh, ask some questions and if you are wrong there, then uh, you're not going for the... Yeah, but that's tough to do. In a, As somebody who interviews a lot of people, I would say that's tough to do. I have, process. I have a couple of questions. I think they they are... Uh, if, when you get them, you should see them coming. But uh, I think, uh, you know, people uh, reveal themselves quite well. Okay, interesting. interesting. I'll have to talk offline. <laughs> So thinking about the broader outdoor industry, when you look ahead to the next, let's say three, five years, maybe beyond, what do you see as the biggest challenges maybe that as an industry we need to address? There's no doubt it's the sustainability part. You know, it's going to be five incredibly tough years. Um, and what's happening is, of course, the legislation are coming in much, much harder. And it is needed, but it's not harmonized. So there's different legislation legislation in different markets. And the tools are not there. There's no standards. So there's a lot of um, uncertainty. Um, but uh, I still, I mean, it's totally necessary uh, for the world. But these legislations should probably come in all industries. Uh, and I think actually outdoor is quite far ahead. Um, and of course, there are complex value chains, but for sure, being able to uh, kind of be on top of uh, what's required in the next five years, I think it's going to be super challenging. Since taking over in 2005, Narona has been through, I would say, from the, looking from the outside in, a lot of different transformations. And I wanted to touch on a few of those topics and, and get some insights from you. So the first being that kind of around omni-channel transformation and i would imagine when you took over in 2005 most of the 99 percent maybe more higher was the business was wholesale since then you now have a footprint of physical stores uh, obviously or your own online stores and i think the other thing is that you've not just gone through that transformation you've also gone through the transformation that in your businesses it's not just purely about selling products in your physical stores you've from the start you've offered more and now today with Narona house downstairs you've gone even further still so what have been the the key learnings over those what 15 18 years on that kind of transformation journey i mean i like i said earlier i always loved retail and i remember i lived in san francisco in 96 uh, for a few months and the North Face had a very cool uh, store um, uh, kind of in the center of San Francisco. I, thought, uh, I mean, it, it gave me a lot of motivation. I think also Armani had a very cool store in an old bank where they have like a, a kind of bar around it all. So the, the retail thing I got uh, from being in the US and really seeing everything there g gave me a lot of ideas um, and when I started uh, with Nuren I always wanted to develop um, a retail part I think peak performance were so smart when they started with both wholesale mail order and their own stores and Patagonia are the same and I, I kind of why didn't we do it <laughs> there was so much change to be done uh, um, in the start when I was a CEO and then we had a 2007 where kind of the quality thing and had to set up the company, really structure it up. So the first possible time was actually in 2009. I mean, that was, uh, for me, it's one of the biggest milestones to finally get uh, a store where I can present the products like I truly believe they should be. And we had so many discussions with wholesalers that, Jürgen, you guys 
let us do the retail stuff and you just sell us the product. And I mean, I've, I've been uh, working in retail for many years. So I uh, kind of, I know what I'm saying is right, but no one would believe us. So when we started uh, Nurena Retail, I wanted uh, to make the the best kind of outdoor uh, chain um, in, uh, in Norway to be able to teach our wholesalers to do a better job. And um, I think we have examples of that now that they call me and ask for certain stuff. So the overall idea is that if you want the most profitable um, outdoor store, you fill it with Norena, 100%. And then the less, <laughs> the less you have, <laughs> the, the less profitable. <laughs> nice, mm -hmm. nice. And um, but I mean, in, inside there is, for for example, we never discount in our store. And that was uh, impossible to do uh, if you asked uh, wholesale. We had uh, a lot of space on a few products. Um, only have one in each size and replenishment that was impossible to do. So there were so many things that was impossible to do that we showed was possible. That's just the operational part of it. Um, the cool thing with uh, working with retail and especially with the uh, you know, our, our customers in uh, our consumers are generally quite high, uh, very happy with the, the brand and very loyal and a lot of passion. So it's very motivating to talk to consumers, Norena consumers. Yeah. Um, wholesalers, uh, they, they don't give you a, like they don't call you if everything is perfect and they shouldn't do, they can do their selling. But if something is wrong, they call you. So. It, it gives the brand kind of a little bad self-confidence. So I want this, so what we saw when we started getting our own stores is that we as a brand got more confident because you got the feed, positive feedback from the end consumer, not kind of, oh, you should be do this and you, all the things you should do that you're not doing, but yeah. they gave you credit for all the good things that you are doing. Yes. So I think that is, it's a very important um, part in building uh, confidence in the organization. Even to, you know, if you show a product to wholesale and say it can't be sold, well, you can prove them differently or you can put it in store and get that proof that it can't be sold. <laughs> so, uh, you know, having that direct uh, access is, um, yeah, I think that's so important. Is the digital aspect of your own channels, does it enable you to maybe ga gain that insight even quicker? Or are there any other things particularly that you learned from that um, launching your own digital channels? Um, I was more visionary on the uh, kind of retail sales than on the e-commerce. So we, even if we were quite early, I, we started direct to consumer in 2003. So, and, and this is, uh, that was kind of, you know, why shouldn't we sell if we have the product in stock and then the customer wants it and the wholesale is not willing to buy it? Uh, why shouldn't I let the consumer buy that from our website? So uh, we had that discussion. I said, I mean, I have to take care of the consumer and give them the product. So we need that web store. And of course, that was all full price. And I said, if the, uh, the retail uh, or the wholesalers, if they have the product and the customers are in store, they will sell that product. They will not then go home and buy it from us there. So the, it's not a competition, but this is, it's, it is very important to take care of the customer. So that was our thinking when we started our e-commerce. I don't, because the early e-commerce on outdoor was so much discount oriented. Uh, so I kind of, uh, is this, uh, how big is this full price thing going to be? Um, so it took a little time before I kind of started understanding the digital and the aspects of it. Uh, but eventually we sourced all that uh, competence in-house and um, I even spent a lot of time uh, with the e-commerce team and building websites. And, uh, and you know, the, the, for our vision again is, you know, uh, we should not decide which channels the consumers want to buy. We offer uh, all the channels and that's why we, 
it's not like this should be that many percent or whatever. We believe in uh, our wholesale distribution, we believe in our retail distribution, and we believe in our e-commerce distribution. It's all harmonized, it's the same price. We try to kind of give the same service in all channels and then the, the consumer should uh, be able to decide where they want to buy it and, and have that as seamless as possible. We still have a, a way to go, but you know, in, in a few years, I think we will, on our website, we will be able to show the inventory on, on most of our wholesalers also. So if they kind of, okay, I want to buy it there. Yeah, that's there. Maybe, maybe you can even get it shipped from any wholesalers that have it uh, over our website, but uh, the, the money goes to that wholesaler, you know. What we are interested in is if a consumer wants the product in a certain way and it's available, that we should get it to the consumer as efficient as possible. There's been a lot of buzz talk, hype around kind of consumer centricity for the last five, 10 years, but I feel like a lot of times it's, it's just talk, but it feels like it's really fundamental at the heart of what you're doing, uh, whether it's the product, the channels that you're selling that product from. You recently started a new venture with uh, Naroda Adventure. So what role do you see that playing and how do you see that, let's say, adding value to the overall Naroda experience? I mean, uh, it came out of a strategy meeting we had um, actually at Canvas Telemark in 2016. The theme of that strategy meeting, and I think it was maybe the best strategy meeting we ever had, in 2029, when Norena is 100 years old, what does it take to be the kind of world leading premium brand? And um, we had uh, linked that to our uh, kind of uh, focus areas and had a lot of, on up front, we put in a lot of kind of sh short quotes of what we believe that was. And one of the discussion came around. If you really want to be a premium brand uh, at uh, that point of time, is it enough to only uh, supply products? Our vision is welcome to nature. That's what's limited what we do. And adventure is for sure <laughs> under that vision. Uh, so one of the conclusions we came out with uh, there is like, yes, we believe that if we want to be a premium brand uh, when we are 100 years old, we also have to offer uh, the adventures for our users. Another important part uh, of that strategy meeting was about an organization that can kind of do stuff uh, that's not inside our, our own operation. So we founded the Nurena Q, which is the business development of Nurena, okay. uh, that can, if we want to do stuff, you know, there's resources there to go out and do it without hurting our operational uh, excellence. And the journey kind of from that decision until we are today, it's uh, kind of um, gone a little uh, up and down, but eventually uh, buying into Vitsark, uh, which was uh, a Norwegian part of uh, Vitsark and, uh, you know, uh, actually a 40 year old uh, adventure company. Okay. And we, we, we know them for many years and they kind of part of the founders are worked close with us in the past. Um, and I kind of always been thinking about this might be a good match. Um, so we bought, the, we, they offered us to buy a share because they needed some funding. And eventually we bought more than 50% and rebranded it right before the COVID. And then we bought the international part of it, um, and we also bought the Canvas uh, Telemark as a, as a you know fully controlled destination. And and we will build um, uh, you know more lodges that we control everything up north. I can talk more about that later. Um, but we are now creating the the fundament, and it's nice to have a fundament where there, there's already some business. So uh, I, I think that's. Uh, uh, easy way into it and, and Vitsark has you know long experience it's a great team they have a lot of good guides and they have a really good uh, uh, adventure program set up um, and uh, now we're kind of working on integrating that into Norana so we we will have one customer service um, and that's custom services uh, within a year or a little more be 24-7 uh, so if you call us, you will talk to one person and they will give you all the answers. They might come back to you because they don't figure it out. There's a second line 
uh, in there, but uh, that team can uh, kind of provide you with clothing, with uh, adventures, uh, and a lot of other stuff. Um, and you know, we started uh, implementing this in April, so uh, you know, it's step by step we're getting there, and I see a lot of signs that this is really beneficial. Uh, and I think we our our customer service team is uh, we got a new leader one year ago and and he's done a fantastic job to uh, to make that team even stronger. Mm. So it feels like you're well. I get it goes back to the same thing about putting the customer at the heart of what you're doing and and you're just enabling the brand to be in contact with the customer for even longer, essentially, and on broader topics. So yeah. Makes a lot of sense, and I think my um, my motivation for really doing the travel, especially the when we control everything. I mean, I'm I'm a very critical consumer myself when I kind of go on travel, <clears throat> and <laughs> but I still know how I would have done it when I organize things ourselves. I I know how to create a pretty good uh, experience and. It doesn't exist in at least in Norway today. What we are planning to do, Canvas Hotel has it, uh, <clears throat> and I really want to share this experience with our users. I think we can we can provide them with experiences which is sort of uh, kind of memories for life, yeah. um, where um, you know, and it's in. Easy logistic. Uh, it's kind of the, stay, the the place you stay, the community you create around the place. Of course, it's the adventures, it's the food, it's the service, it's the gear, everything in there. Um, I think it's uh, very cool to be able to share that with uh, with our consumers. Absolutely. On the subject of sustainability, you talked about this in the past that you don't see this as let's say a race against the competition it's it's really about um how as an industry you know we can move forward together and really improve the situation so collaboration i think is going to be a key factor in facilitating that so what would you like to see from maybe uh industry associations or from the industry as a whole to facilitate this type of collaboration and cooperation because i think from what i see it's still there's a lot of people doing a lot of work but i feel like if there was more work together more collaborative work we could be going further faster so is there something that you would like to see going forward when you look at the legislation and um, traceability and and all the data that we would need to kind of prove where we are maybe the industry is not high enough even because you know an example is um, in the us they are very aware of cotton now that they, it should not come from uh, certain regions in china so at the border you, you get stopped and you have to prove that the cotton is not from there and when we talk to our supplier they said uh, we will not reveal our source but we have all the certifications and then eventually we get the source and i see the certification like this paper and i mean what does that prove it's like a paper and you have the products there um if we if we kind of gonna solve this environmental issue it, almost un has to be the stand you know they have to build standards so we talk about the same thing you know, you cannot have one country do this and another country do this. The world, you know, there is nothing solely made in one country. You know, to kind of prove where everything is from, all the social rights and and uh, all the chemicals, and have a hundred different standards. You know, it's not going to work. There have to be single source of pseudo truth that everyone is using, and I think the uh, uh, SAC and the HIG. It's a very good start, and I see a lot of NGOs kind of working against it, and I'm like, shit, what's the alternative? You know, they, they think that this is something you do to kind of get a, get around the sustainability, but I think, you know, we want to solve it. You know, we live on the same planet. Uh, um, but if we get this uh, fully uh, integrated network um, 
on a sort of interstate company. Yeah. That's the only way to solve it. I think we're, or else we're going to struggle. And he gets the closest we have. I think there is a good, or a lot of good um, industry corporation, uh, corporations, but it would have been even better if we lifted it to a UN uh, level. If they could kind of, this is the standards, this is the uh, sort of LCAs on cotton or, or whatever. Uh, and there's so much work that needs to be done to update and get uh, this going. Uh, so the, my biggest fear is that we kind of, if it's our industry or if it's the textile industry or if it's EU, you have to be even on a higher level. And I don't see any of those initiatives right now. And in the meantime, um, the apparel industry is trying to build at least something that we can work on. I wonder then if it's, we need associations like the European Outdoor Group and the OIA in the US to almost come together to have one, okay, it's still not global, but at least it's it's better because otherwise there's, the lobbying is done, I guess, at not the right level to, to really address this today. I mean, we, we are sort of setting up our digital plan of it. And if there's um, kind of one database, it's so much simpler than what we do today when we have to ask each supplier for all the data and they have to ship out all the data to each of their customers instead of a sort of central database to just plug into. Um, that will at least keep uh, quite a bit cost down for, for the whole world. And uh, all that money could be kind of put into fixing the problem instead of uh, kind of talking about it. So let's move on to slightly lighter topics. Uh, so what's your favorite piece of sports or outdoor gear? And you're not allowed to, <laughs> to, to say Narona, <laughs> something else, which I know covers a lot, but I'm sure in your garage you have a non Narona product somewhere. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, of course, uh, she, ski boots and bindings and uh, um, and so on. Um, of course, I, um, I, I, I probably have um, um, sunglasses uh, from Oakley. I, you know, the, those I use a lot, so they, they can for sure be there. I mean, uh, my skis was uh, one of my favorite things, but they also have a Nurana logo. <laughs> so, uh, um, and I think when I find the good ski touring boots, uh, I'm very happy uh, and uh, I try to buy more pairs. So I love windsurfing, so I use uh, starboard uh, okay. uh, gear there. Yeah. Mm, and uh, of course, uh, of course, my bike, my uh, specialized uh, mountain bike. Okay. Uh, that's a, I mean, I always like Specialized. I think they have a beautiful bikes. Yeah. Mm. yeah, absolutely. And so what book would you recommend somebody to read if they wanted to, <laughs> or if they are or wanted to be a leader within the out sports and outdoor industry? Is there something that stands out? From good to great, I think a lot of people have read. And uh, I, I mean, I think that is a really, really good uh, book. Um, and uh, but I also think uh, a lot of the uh, books about Steve Jobs. Uh, I think uh, especially if you want to be in the premium side and you know like both functionality and quality and and design uh, and also uh, user centric. Um, uh, as I said, I, I was actually very impressed by um, the book of. Um, from Walter Isaacson about Elon Musk. Yes. I think that, I mean, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. It's just, um, okay, uh, he's a special guy, but uh, and maybe crazy, but if, all the things he achieved, I think yeah. it's just out of this world. Literally in some cases. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I haven't really found that many new books lately, and maybe I'm not uh, searching the right places. Uh, but uh, I have a um, podcast that I think is really, really great. Okay. And it's called Acquired. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, two American guys from the West Coast. They originally come from the tech industry. But what they do, which I think is so fascinating, they talk about, um, you know, the whole history of the brands. And there's an episode on uh, Louis Vuitton on the Hennessy there, which is fantastic. I think it's like three hours. Okay. They talk about uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway yeah. for 10 hours, three episodes. Wow. And, and then you get sort of, it's something, uh, you get sort of the long view. And I yeah. think that's important when you do stuff. You, yeah. you don't see it when you see into the future, but you have to turn around and look backwards and kind of 
connecting the dots like Steve Jobs says yeah. you know um, that podcast is really good at doing that and uh, you see many companies you know uh, that are great today they've also been in situations where they're like are they going to survive or not uh, so um, you know to be able to kind of use the the zoom and zoom out and in I think this podcast is doing it really well and they are very good at highlighting um, what is the they use this book seven powers to kind of evaluate each company which is also really good and if you have the awareness you know from the company you are running what powers are you going to use where are you going to kind of uh, what's going to be your recipe yeah. hmm. I think that's uh, I don't know if any book has that but um, for me that's always you know what's the recipe why are you gonna be in business and uh, is it best uh, Jeff Bezos that says there's two kind of companies um, either you try to sell as cheap as possible or as uh, expensive as possible I think that's a pretty interesting thing you have to figure out where you want to be so what's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received uh, it's a difficult uh, one um, I try to uh, be open and listen um, and I try to take in a lot of feedback I think when I hear stuff um, it kind of goes into a process and eventually uh, the my uh, subconscious come out with some answers okay. I'm not yeah. always certain where they're coming from yeah. and uh, uh, b- but I think a lot of the the decisions and things we do it comes from uh, you know that you hear the same thing many times or that you uh, listen and uh, get some time to think about it Um, but there is some some uh, key things I think on on the board level that's really cool uh, if I'm going to be concrete because you know I don't think things often can be quite simple and still very valuable and uh, one of our old board members, he once said, what if we, we talked about how big the collection or, you know, the complexity of all that. And what if we are a company that just makes the hundred best products? That's it. You know, it's uh, one in, one out, hundred best products. Yeah. And that kind of talk um, ended us um, by, we didn't set a, a limit of hundred, but we put in uh, size of the collection goal so we don't so we have this one in one out yeah. and that talk uh, back in 2008 when we did it we reduced our SQ count with 30% over one year and kind of got to control it and um, it's a I think that was a very uh, good advice to be able to not expand your collection too much so if today was your last day here as CEO and their owner what would be your message to your team continue in the same direction (laughs) perfect (laughs) perfect (laughs) great Uh, so if you could give future leaders of the sports and outdoor industry three pieces of advice what would you give I mean they are so colored by where I come from but uh, and and they are maybe like the first page of any business book but uh, you know through um, users first I think a lot of people use it and say it but I, I am not sure that they, the the user uh, sees that and I, I mean we still have uh, work to do there um, but um, I mean at the end of the day if you want to build a brand and brand is not a one-time product it's you buy you want the consumer to come by back and buy more and continue to be loyal that's that you know that's the if you have a logo on it that's kind of the whole point of it and um, you have to figure out who are your customers and uh, be loyal to them and um, do that over time and I think uh, they are actually going to be loyal back yeah Mm. Um, I think also the other one will figure out where you want to be Um, you know do you want to be selling as expensive as possible or as cheap as possible and uh, this is more how I like to do stuff but we have sourced in through the years you know uh, uh, sourcing out uh, I don't understand the point we 
don't really work with consultants. We do so, uh, and for, for the years we're just taking in more and more and more and more. And I think then you can create something really cool if you, um, I mean, I, I'm not against consultants by itself, but if they are co- going to come in and understand your brand and uh, understand what you need and then disappear out again and then come in when you need them again, I, I think that's a really hard way of, of working. Mm-hmm. But of course, I'm colored by um, kind of the premiumness and the level that we want to be at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Jürgen, for your time and your insights. It's been super interesting and I wish we had more time, but uh, maybe another time. Um, It's been a really great story. I've loved being here. Thank you for your hospitality um, last night as well at the opening party. It was great. And congratulations with everything you've achieved. It's, uh, It's, yeah, very inspiring from my point of view for someone who's been in the industry for 30 years so so yeah thank you again and thank you for being on the show and thank you for coming here it's been a pleasure i hope you enjoyed the episode as much as i did we love to read your feedback so please leave your thoughts in the comments below thanks again for your support